Since 1971, when President Nixon took the United States off what was left of the gold standard, the world has operated under a system of money called fiat. The dollar, the pound, the euro are all government fiat currencies. Fiat is a Latin word meaning let it be so. It is the law that this government currency be money. Indeed, without that legal enforcement and the fact that we must pay taxes in this money, that dollar bill or that computer digit that represents a dollar would be pretty much meaningless. Only the government has the power to issue fiat money, but banks can create it through lending. If somebody wants to borrow $10, a bank can create it from nowhere and lend it. It can then charge interest. Banks also create money by lending against an asset, such as a house. They're given the deeds to the house and they create the money out of nowhere and lend it. Add interest, of course. Over the last 40 years, since this fiat system of money became the global norm, the supply of money has grown exponentially. In fact, we've seen the greatest growth in the supply of money in history. But who benefits? Of course, those that have the power to issue money, governments and banks. They haven't had to do anything productive, they just create money. Then those companies and individuals that get this money early. They can spend it before the prices of the things they want to buy have risen to reflect the new money in circulation. In other words, they get services, products, assets cheap. But prices soon rise. So holders of assets such as shares or houses will then see gains without there necessarily being any improvements to the company or house in question. Often, this can lead to speculative bubbles. Who gets this money early? However money is created, be it through lending, fractional reserve banking, financial bailouts, or old-fashioned money printing, banks are always at or near the top of the money-issuing pyramid. Next come corporations who borrow large sums, those on lucrative government contracts for new ventures, particularly overseas, banks' associate companies and partners, those that borrow early and at low rates, and the bank's senior employees. They all quickly get their share of the pie. In some cases, this will come in the form of bonuses. But what about those at the bottom of the pyramid? Those on fixed wages or incomes, those who live in remote areas, or those with savings? By the time this newly created money has filtered down to them, the prices of the things they want to buy have increased. Their savings buy them less, however, and their wages remain largely unchanged. In some cases, they have to take on debt just to be able to afford the things they were previously able to buy, which means they have to go back to the banks. In reality, this process of creating money only redistributes wealth from the bottom to the top of the pyramid. And thus that ever-increasing gulf between rich and poor gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Governments don't rule the world. Goldman Sachs rules the world. It was the comment heard round the world, one that generated widespread reaction from papers and pundits alike. We appreciate your candor. However, it doesn't help the rest of us, does it? But instead of talking about the comment itself, most outlets immediately sought to shoot the messenger, Alessio Rastani. Forbes called him a psychopath. CNBC suggests it might be a hoax. New York Magazine wonders if it is a hoax or perhaps our worst nightmare. Well, regardless of Rastani's intentions, the bigger question has been largely ignored. Was he wrong about the power of Goldman Sachs? And why was everyone so shocked? After all, right here at RT, in our studios, we've had several guests, bona fide traders, even former Goldman Sachs employees who have said the very same thing. Washington is not the biggest player in this. The global bankers are the biggest players, the global hedge fund managers, uh, and that's where the action, that's who's determining the outcome of this, not 
uh, not the players in Washington. They have already ceded control to the global banking industry. Wall Street has been pulling the strings in Washington um, from the get-go. It is the largest um, sector of campaign contributions, and that's to both parties. But for the mainstream media who don't air views like these, Rastani's honesty was unexpected, uh, says Survive um, and Thrive TV's George Heminger. When they asked him these questions on BBC, he just let it all hang out, and the actual truth came across. Rastani also sent shockwaves around the world when he told the BBC that most traders don't really care if and when the economy is fixed. Personally, I've been dreaming of this moment for three years. Uh, I, I, I had a confession, which is, uh, I go to bed every night, I dream of another recession. The BBC interview has now gone viral. If you could see the people around me, jaws have collectively dropped at what you've just said. Perhaps their jaws wouldn't have dropped had they only read Matt Taibbi's July 2009 Rolling Stone article, The Great American Bubble Machine. In it, he famously described Goldman Sachs as a, quote, great vampire squid wrapped around the face of humanity, relentlessly jamming its blood funnel into anything that smells like money. Taibbi discussed with us recently how, although people are unaware of it, the big bank has profound power in society. How much are you paying for gas? How much are you paying for electricity? How much are you paying for your credit cards, um, your mortgages? Uh, how much are you paying in taxes? And how much your, of your tax dollars are going to debt service? That is what democracy looks like! Unlike the mainstream media, few here would be shocked by Rastani's comments. We're going to shut down Wall Street! For nearly two weeks, these protesters have been out every day, hoping to bring an end, or at least awareness, to what many call a corrupt system. What do we want? Revolution! When do we want it? Now! And still others have argued for years that the government's actions are dictated by the big banks. The very special interests in, on Wall Street, uh, the insurance industry, uh, these, guys, these are the people who are writing the laws that Obama is passing. They are keeping him in power. They're the ones that have financed his campaign, and, and, and the laws are being written for their benefit. Two streets, our streets! As anger builds here, perhaps better questions need to be asked here so that a different message is sent to decision makers here. That the system that has been sustained and protected for decades might need to change. In Washington, Christine Frizzau, RT. of the agenda for this meeting and I think one of the things that you say is that the euro is at the top of it about what's going to happen to the euro why is that so important why is that at the top of the agenda well because uh, they've been working so hard in creating this European Union which is actually falling apart of the seams we were watching this uh, fall apart of the seams live and in real time and this is one of the things of obvious concern to the Bilderbergers because uh, their plan is not about creating one world uh, government as so many people mistakenly believe but rather creating what they call themselves the aristocracy of purpose between North American and European elites and the best ways to manage the planet. In other words, the creation of One World Company Limited. And to have the One World Company Limited, you cannot have countries, you need to have economic blocks. And to have economic blocks, you obviously need the euro for Europe to have this block as one. And obviously, you know, this euro is falling apart of the seams. They must be terrified about that. Well, they're absolutely terrified, especially as, you know, there are a lot of people out there who are suggesting that uh, certain countries, such as Greece, for example, should just walk away, and Spain should walk away. I've been saying it for a long time. Not only that, but uh, uh, actually uh, France and Germany are also threatening to walk away at least unless certain steps are taken. Obviously, Germany does not want to, to carry the burden of, 
this 750 billion you know dollar euro bailout of which Germany has to pay 150 billion and we, we're seeing the consequences of it that simply the people are sick and tired of what's going on and the people are beginning to lose their fear and that's what terrifies them more than anything else it's not that you know euro can fall apart it's the fact that people are beginning to lose their fear um, one of the things I don't understand in, in relation to that is that some people say that, that the group is exploiting the financial crisis in, you know, in Greece and in Spain and other places uh, to advance their efforts to make the IMF a world treasury. How does that all fit in? Well, it fits in very simply because, you know, uh, as an example, the money that actually is being lent to Greece is going to go right to the bankers. You know, so Greece is going to be left with all the debt and not going to get no benefit. The same thing has happened in Russia in the 1990s. The IMF money just went through Russia and went back right back out to the bankers. And the same thing happened in Africa. When, when George H.W. Bush, the, you know, the, the father, with his famous read my lips, no new taxes, you know, and he had to raise his taxes. It wasn't because it, it was a humanitarian gesture to help third world countries. It's because that money lent to the third world nations you know, black Africa, etc., was actually going to pay the interest to the bankers, so nobody gets anything out of it but the bankers. Gary Franchi here with the Reality Report. Now here is Patrick Wood with his ongoing investigation into the Trilateral Commission. Many people want to know just what is the Trilateral Commission. Well, it's a private organization that was co-founded by David Rockefeller and Zbigniew Brzezinski in 1973. Its stated goal was to foster a new international economic order. In my 32 years of monitoring this group and its members, I believe it has largely achieved this goal. Membership was originally picked from Japan, Europe, and North America, but has since been expanded to include a few other countries. Total membership has tended to gravitate around 300, roughly 100 from each region. It consists of academics, corporate executives, and high-ranking politicians. Within the corporate realm, there are several media giants and international banks in addition to global manufacturing. Since at least 1976, Commission members have dominated the executive branch of the United States, leadership of the World Bank, U.S. trade policy, and foreign policy. Should such an international membership meeting behind closed doors have such a large influence on American affairs? Certainly not. The Logan Act, for instance, forbids unauthorized citizens from negotiating with foreign governments. However, this has not deterred them either here or abroad. According to David Rockefeller himself, Trilateral Commission members were instrumental in the creation of the European Union. They've also been active in creating other regional groupings around the world as well. No, the Trilateral Commission is not your friendly neighborhood government organization. As I have carefully documented in the August review, Commission members and their companies have literally plundered America over the years, and often at taxpayer expense. If you're interested, you can see a complete list of Trilateral Commission members on augustreview.com and check it out for yourself.